Approximately 90% of people with MS, if they have a spinal tap, have the finding of oligoclonal bands isolated to the cerebrospinal fluid, but not in the blood. But do these bands matter? Do they influence the prognosis of the disease? What about the number of bands? I made a video explaining oligoclonal bands and how they're used to help diagnose MS, but there was one thing I neglected, which many commenters brought up, which is, do these bands actually matter? And I decided to do a deep dive, and I found six scientific publications that are going to help us to answer this exact question. And remember what Einstein said, assumptions are made, and often assumptions are wrong. Let's start with a study published in JAMA in 2001. This is a single institution study looking at 1,800 cerebrospinal fluid studies. Most of these people didn't have MS, and they used a very interesting methodology where they compared people with so-called benign MS, in other words, with relatively low disability, compared to people with more severe MS. And so they had 44 in total with MS in one of those two categories, and they excluded people in the middle with sort of moderate disability. So people with benign MS had an EDSS or expanded disability status scale of three or less, less than 3.5, and there were 14 such individuals versus severe MS and EDSS greater than 7.5, meaning requiring a wheelchair and having a significant amount of physical disability, and there were 30 of these individuals. So of the 14 with benign MS, 7 out of 14 did not have oligoclonal bands. And you can see right away this is a disproportionately low number because 90% should have oligoclonal bands, whereas only 7 of the 30 with severe disease did not have bands. Now, 7 out of 30 is also greater than 10%. I'm not sure why. So it's certainly possible to have severe MS without bands, but it appears to be less common. And the mean number of bands for those people with benign disease was 2.86, and the mean number of bands for people with severe disease was 5.7. You can see the same thing in graphical form, average number of oligoclonal bands, benign versus severe disease. There's definitely a big difference. By the way, my name is Brandon Bieber. I make videos about MS every Wednesday, so please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Next, we'll move to a study by Dr. Christopher Peroni at Penn, pictured to the right. And he had 127 patients with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis on disease-modifying therapy and monitored for at least two years. And he compared people with 10 or more oligoclonal bands versus people with less than 10 oligoclonal bands. And there were a roughly equal number in both groups. And he found that people with more bands had more relapses and more new MRI lesions. Although there was no difference in the use of new gate assistive devices such as a cane or walker. However, when looking at brain atrophy, some measures showed a difference between more bands and less bands. For instance, the lateral ventricles, the fluid-filled spaces which enlarge when the brain shrinks, tended to grow more in people with greater than 10 bands. However, looking at the third ventricle or just cortical atrophy itself, there was no statistically significant difference. And you can look at the number of steroid prescriptions, which is essentially a marker of relapses, and for people people with less than 10 bands, it was 17 versus 46 in people with more than 10 bands. And again, there were roughly equal number of patients in these two groups. If you look at new lesions on MRI for less than 10 bands, it was 48 and virtually double 107 in people with more than 10 bands. And if you looked at the relapse rate, there's no contest, a relapse rate of 0.7 per year, in other words, an average of seven relapses per 10 years, versus less than 0.2 in people with less than 10 bands. Now, as I said, with brain atrophy, there was no clear statistically significant difference, but if you looked at only accelerated brain atrophy, people who are losing more than 1% of brain volume per year, there was a statistically significant difference with people having more bands more likely to have accelerated brain atrophy, p-value of 0.03. Now let's move to the United Kingdom. In this study, only 3% of people with MS did not have oligoclonal bands. I'm not sure why. Maybe they relied on the spinal tap and were skeptical of the diagnosis in anyone who did not have bands. And they also found that the prognosis was better in people without bands, and they estimated a roughly 49% lower risk of requiring a cane. 
However, they thought diagnosis may not have been 100% accurate in the article. For example, people with negative oligoclonal bands were more likely to have a nonspecific MRI or atypical clinical features such as having skin changes, which are not usually associated with MS. So if you look at their data, you can see uh, white is people with, with oligoclonal bands, the dark is people without oligoclonal bands, and some people without bands had a normal MRI scan of the brain, which is really unusual in MS, and many people with negative oligoclonal bands had a nonspecific MRI scan of the brain. Many people in the general population, especially those with migraine or vascular risk factors such as diabetes and hypertension, can have nonspecific changes in the subcortical white matter, which could be mistaken for demyelinating disease. And can you can see clearly people who had bands were more likely to have a brain scan judged to be typical of MS. Now, if you look at this survival cord curve, this is the time until people need a cane to walk 100 meters, in other words, to reach EDSS of 6. And the solid line is people who had bands, and the dotted line is people who did not have bands. And you can see everyone starts off not needing a cane, and then over time, more and more people as they get older are likely to require a cane. And early on, you can see people without bands did quite a bit better, with far fewer requiring a cane, but later on, the lines appear to cross, and it seems seems equivocal. However, it turns out those without bands were a little bit more likely to be older, and adjusting for age, the group without bands had a 49% reduced risk of requiring a cane adjusted for age. So a pretty significant uh, difference, and all the data really goes in the same direction. And next we move to a meta-analysis, a review of 71 articles by some very well-known authors. I give credit to Dr. Ruth Dobson, who's well-known for her content about MS on Twitter, and legendary professor Gavin Giovanoni of the Barts in London Multiple Sclerosis blog. And they looked at 12,253 people with MS, and 87.6 7% of them had oligoclonal bands in cerebral spinal fluid. They also looked at 2,685 people with CIS. This is clinically isolated syndrome, people who had a single demyelinating event, such as optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, but did not meet the diagnostic criteria for MS. And 68.6% .6 of these individuals with CIS had bands. And you'll note that this number is a little bit low, lower than the expected roughly 90%. Now, the point is, if you looked at people with MS, those who had bands were roughly twice as likely to have disability progression. And those with clinically isolated syndrome, CIS, who had bands were roughly 10 times as likely to develop multiple sclerosis. In other words, to get a new attack or new lesion on a subsequent MRI such that they would meet the diagnostic criteria for MS. So yet again, having bands is worse. Okay, but what about Sweden, famous for their incredible national multiple sclerosis registry? They had 7,322 people with MS who had spinal taps, and 828 of those individuals, or 11.3%, did not have bands. And this was, roughly speaking, what you would expect, around 90% have bands. And they looked at survival curves to reach various disability outcomes. And the first one is EDSS3, which is mild disability, a relatively low level of disability. And they compared people with bands, the dark line, to people without bands, the gray line. And you could see that more people lasted longer if they didn't have bands before reaching EDSS3, so they did somewhat better. And the hazard ratio was 1.5. 0.29, meaning that if you did have bands, you had a 29% higher chance of getting to EDSS3. Not a huge difference, but a real and statistically significant difference. The same was true with EDSS4, moderate disability. You can clearly see the gray line is above the dark line for most of the lifespan. Near the end of the lifespan, they come close together, although there are other things going on. People have disability for other reasons, which may muddy the data, but the hazard ratio was 1.38, meaning 38% increased rich, 
risk of reaching EDSS4 or having moderate disability if you have oligoclonal bands. Now, for people requiring a cane to walk 100 meters, EDSS6, you can see the curve separated a little bit but then came back together, and there was no statistically significant difference. There was a hazard ratio of 1.2, in other words, 20% higher risk if you had bands but no statistically significant difference. The p-value was 0.08. They also looked at time to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, and people with bands were 20% more likely to convert from relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So again, people with bands in the spinal fluid tend to do worse on the average. And this was recapitulated by a case control study from Portugal. So here they had 196 people with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, 176 or 90 percent had bands, 10 percent did not, and 62 of the 196, that's 31.6 percent of them, converted to secondary progressive MS during the duration of the study. 59 of those 62 had bands and only three did not. That works out to 33.5% of people with bands develop secondary progressive multiple sclerosis versus only 15% of people without bands. In other words, if you had bands, you had double the risk of developing progressive MS. What about requiring a cane? This is the percentage of people who needed a cane by the end of the study reaching EDSS of 6. That occurred in 56 people or 28.5%. 54 of those 56 had bands and only two did not. That worked out to 31% of people with bands requiring a cane versus 10% who did not. In other words, triple the risk of requiring a cane if you had bands. If you haven't been keeping track, that is six out of six studies, all of them, showing an association of worse prognosis with having oligoclonal bands in the cerebrospinal fluid. So even though there's a lot of interest in other prognostic biomarkers in MS, oligoclonal bands in the cerebrospinal fluid may be one of the best ones, even though doing a spinal tap is relatively undesirable. For instance, you've probably heard of serum neurofilament light chain, which is, of course, a lot easier to obtain just because it's in the blood. Serum neurofilament or neurofilament light chain is a breakdown product of the central nervous system and is elevated in various central nervous system diseases, but is elevated in multiple sclerosis relapses and it is associated with MS progression. There's also protein chitinase 3 like 1 and looking at oligoclonal bands that are immunoglobin M instead of all of the bands, specifically the newly formed immunoglobins, and also protein 1433, which is most associated with prion diseases, but also has some association with multiple sclerosis as as well. So what do I think about the data overall and should we use this information to actually change the way that we manage multiple sclerosis? Well I have to say given that all of the studies essentially show the same conclusion I have to admit there is some correlation between presence of bands and the prognosis of multiple sclerosis on the average. But I say that with several caveats. One is that there are a lot of other well-known clinical predictors of prognosis that associate with long-term prognosis to some extent. For instance, people with progressive multiple sclerosis tend to do worse than people with relapsing onset MS on the average. People whose initial symptoms involve the spinal cord causing weakness or bladder problems tend to, to do worse than people whose first symptoms involve optic neuritis for example, people who have severe relapses and poor recovery or multiple relapses close together early in the disease tend to do worse. And those who acquire moderate disability, EDSS 3 or 4 earlier, are more likely to develop significant disabilities, say EDSS 6, 6.5, or 7, later in the disease. In other words, developing more disability early on is worse on the average. So it's not like we have to go entirely based Based on biomarkers, there's a lot of evidence that the prognosis of MS is influenced to some extent by clinical factors, and also it's known that people who have a lot of
lot of spinal cord lesions and spinal cord atrophy and brain atrophy tend to do worse on the average. The other thing I would mention is that the correlations aren't all that strong in some of the studies. Like in the Swedish registry, there was only a hazard ratio of 1.2, in other words, 20% greater risk of requiring a cane if you had bands compared to if you didn't. And it wasn't even statistically significant. And if you looked at the other markers of moderate disability, there really, really weren't huge hazard ratios. So the risk with bands is probably only a little bit higher than without bands. The other caveat I would make is that unfortunately with multiple sclerosis there's a lot of misdiagnosis. In a study done at Cedar sinai and UCLA it's estimated that 17 or 18 percent of people with MS are actually misdiagnosed and they have something else. I have a separate video on this exact study and topic if you want to take a look. And what's going to tend to happen is people who are misdiagnosed with MS they're going to be much more likely to have a normal spinal tap without bands and they're going to end up biasing these studies because those people are much less Less likely to have disability later on in life because they don't even have multiple sclerosis in the first place. And so I take these studies with a grain of salt. Now, do I think that explains entirely the differences in data? No, because otherwise you'd have to have a huge number of people who are misdiagnosed, but I think it exaggerates the difference between bands and no bands. So my personal opinion, if the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is clear, let's say from clinical symptoms exam and MRI, should you do a spinal tap just to see if you have bands? My personal opinion would be no. And the other thing is, how exactly are you going to use this information to change treatment? For instance, there's pretty strong evidence that people tend to do better on highly effective disease-modifying therapies. That's probably going to be true for people with or without bands. Even though the prognosis may be better without bands, you still may do better on highly effective treatments. So is it really going to change the treatment decision? The one exception to this, I would say, is maybe someone who has a question diagnosis of multiple sclerosis where it's unclear and they have a spinal tap without bands, maybe a practical approach would be to not use disease modifying therapy and observe until the diagnosis is more clear with follow-up exams and MRI scans. Anyways, I'd be interested to know about your own experience. Did you have bands? If you know the answer, do you know how many bands you had? And what has your course of MS been like? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?